Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. You know, yesterday, the 1st of June 2015, the South African Revenue Services brought a court case against the future president of South Africa, Commissar and Commander-in-Chief Julius Malin. They wanted to use the Insolvency Act to sequestrate him. Well, there are so many options that can be utilized from the Tax Administration Act to achieve what they thought they wanted to achieve there. And the court excellently demonstrated and illustrated to them that there's no necessity to use the Insolvency Act because once you use the Insolvency Act and sequestrate a member of parliament, a credible leader, a future president of this country, you're going to make him incapable to occupy office to generate income, which you will need part of it as taxation in the future. So what I've been pursued of, if you want to sequestrate a leader of a political party, other than politics, it is then that the, the representatives of SARS withdrew the case because they knew that they were in pursuit of a narrow political program. And why were they doing that? They wanted to make sure that the commander-in-chief of the EFF is no longer a member of parliament because once you are sequestrated, you cannot be a member of parliament. They wanted to prevent him from coming here to parliament to speak on behalf of the workers. They wanted to prevent him to come here in parliament and hold the executive accountable to say to the president of the ANC, Mr. Zuma, that he must pay back the money. They wanted to prevent him from stating the obvious fact that the ANC government killed and massacred workers in Marikana for demanding their salaries. They wanted to prevent him from advocating for massive industrial expansion which is protected here in South Africa and the entire African continent. And why is such the case? Is because this parliament has been turned into a rubber stamp of the executive. In most instances, whatever comes here from the executive is just rubber stamped. It has now even gone further from being a rubber stamp to even becoming a replacement of institutions supporting democracy. How do you explain the fact that after the public protector has finalized their report and given remedial action, Parliament engages in the same activity, recommends a different action, and deploys a minister of police to show some bias scope to say that Mr. Zuma, the president of the ANC, must not pay back the money? How do you explain that? Is this how we have come to? As South Africa, we need to deal with those uh, issues differently. Now, the founding values of South Africa's democracy, amongst other things, speak about a multi-party system of democracy, meaning that all of us who are here, who are representing political parties, carry the obligation and right to make sure that we protect the system. We protect this parliament. But the attitude and approach of the ruling party does not encapsulate and understand the meaning of multi-party system of democracy. It does not respect the rule of law. It does not respect the constitution. That is why of the cases which the chief whip of the majority party mentioned here, 80% of the cases which parliament has been faced with, parliament has lost. As a matter of fact, on many occasions, Parliament has lost cases uh, against members of Parliament which, uh, whom they are supposed to, 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 to protect. It is this Parliament that has rejected that we should utilize a secret ballot to remove a president who was voted by a secret ballot. It is this parliament which has re refused and rejected a, a, a motion by the economic freedom fighters that a commission of inquiry should be established to 
investigate and determine the remuneration and conditions of mine workers in South Africa. It is this parliament which has replaced the functions of the public protector. And we cannot leave it like that. Now, the most sinful thing that happens about this parliament is its, its inability to pass proper legislation as it relates to businesses and the corporate sector. Even when they are passed, they are not implemented. We'll give an example, Minister of uh, Mineral Resources, that there's a Minerals and Petroleum Resources Development Act, which says that all multinational corporations and companies that export minerals should report to you of all their exports. They're not doing so now, and they're not doing anything about it. There is an act which has been returned to Parliament by the President. The legal office here in Parliament said there is nothing wrong with that act, but it's still not law. What do you make of this parliament? Twelve months later, there is simple legislation that has to be passed to guide on what is to be done with our mineral resources, but nothing is being done. Now, I'm rushing too quickly to what has to, to change with regards to parliament. I think we need to implement a functional proportional representation system with regards to presiding officers. Because all of us have been elected, we must be allowed to be house chairs as well and preside over the sittings of this house, but also we must be allowed to chair committees. I think we must have a proportional system that say we must chair committees. By virtue of being a ruling party, does not make you possess knowledge of anything that you're dealing with. I can be a far much better chairperson of the Standing Committee on Finance than the current chair. It's a matter of fact. I mean, uh, and, 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 and many other useful members of parliament can contribute to the development of this parliament. But also the parliamentary oversight authority should be Order functional and must deal with uh, issues that relate to this house, including appointment of researchers and people who support the committees. Because now all those people who are appointed are a product of the deployment policy of the ANC. The last issue, uh, speaker, this parliament should ratify the revised protocol of the Pan-African Parliament. You never spoke about the Pan-African Parliament in your international relations perspective. It is one of the most important instruments because once we pass legislation here, we can canvas it with the entire continent in terms of what we need to do. Because if we think that we can act in silos outside of what is happening continentally, we're going to lose direction. Unless all these things have been dealt with, the EFF will never support the budget vote of Parliament. So don't support it. Thank you very much.